All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Today, I want you to make sure that we look at the young adults and the COVID-19. This is especially in context of should the schools open or not, should the colleges open or not, or what is happening. So I have a number of uh, points to make with you. Again, the decisions are for the communities, for the parents, for the children. So it is not my decision. However, I wanted to make sure that I can present some points that can help you and the folks who may be going to schools and colleges understand the risk and then try to figure out what should be done about that. So um, I will put my bias or my opinion, my stance right here in the beginning. I do not believe that colleges and universities and schools should open at this time. I think we should wait for another few months and let the vaccines arrive, let some more herd immunity develop, and then expose our children at this time, the risk is too high, not only to them, but then they will become super spreaders as well. And then second waves will arrive too. So <clears throat> my apologies for the for my throat. There is smoke around here. There are fires in the Santa Clara area. And that smoke uh, causes a little bit of cough. All right, so let's start. <clears throat> Look, here are a few things that, that are interesting for us as cool beans. So first of all, check this out, that this is a study that has figured out, or in the study they found out, that between 24th Feb to July 12th, during this time frame, the, uh, the infection rate or the cases for COVID-19 in youngsters have actually increased. So if you see here in this box, zero to four years of age, the infection rate in February used to be 0.3%. And now it has risen to 2.2%. What that means is that children of zero to four years of age, earlier in February timeframe, one in 300 children used to get infected. And now, out of 300, about seven children are getting infected. So that is a very large change. For the age of 5 to 14, in early February part, 0.8% used to be the infection rate or the cases. Now it is 4.6%. So out of 100 children of age 5 to 14, one child used to about one child used to get the infection now in july and onwards 4.6 children are getting infected 15 to 24 years of age in february 4.5 percent so out of 100 4.5 or about four or five you can say uh, people uh, or youngsters used to get infected. Now, 15% out of 115 people of age 15 to 24 are getting infected. So that is a very large rise. And the rise is because the infection is becoming more prevalent. The people around the children are becoming more sick. And so children are naturally exposed to it. Schools are opening, colleges are opening, people are letting their guard down, they're becoming claustrophobic, they're becoming upset, they're becoming psychologically upset, they're sit sitting in, in the lockdowns. So there are many factors, but infection in the youngsters are increasing. This is not a good thing. The problem with the infections in youngsters are not only just this, that there are uh, death rate death rate is associated with the youngsters. And in my second point, you can see part of it that one in three adults, young adults, can develop severe infections as well. So that is a new trend now. So one, there is a danger of severe or death, severe cases of COVID-19 or death. Secondly, they, they become super spreaders. If they have mild case, then they would give the infection to others. So second point. So the first point, the first takeaway is infection rates are increasing in youngsters. Send them to school if we do that. 
that would only increase it further. And, and they are saying that the infection rate in adults and youngsters are now shrinking, narrowing. The difference in the infection rate is narrowing very fast. And we should not do things that would actually further shrink it. Second point, one out of three young adults, and the young adult definition over here, 18 to 24, so 25. This is a UCSF research. I have the research paper over here. So this is the this is the research paper. And, and it has a lots of very, very interesting uh, data in it. Actually, this one over here. Um, yeah, here, one in three young adults may face severe COVID-19 UCSF study. And this is the study over here. Um, yeah, so I think this is the study, the next page. So what we're seeing over here is that one out of three people, young people, are going to develop or are at a risk of severe COVID-19. That is not a good thing. So one in the previous slide, we are seeing that there is a rise in infection uh, rate or cases in youngs, youngsters. And then there is a rise in severity of the infection as well. So that is not a good thing. And so if you see here, this research um, done by UCSF researchers, they had looked at 8,400 men and women of the age 18 to 25. And what they found was this. In men, overall, 33% of the men were at a risk of developing severe COVID-19. 33, one in three. Women, 30%. So slightly less, but still one in three. Smokers and non-smokers together, 31.5%. And check this out. Those who are not smoking, 16.1%. So those young adults who are smoking or are using e-cigarettes, their chances of becoming severe are double compared to those who are not using, who are not smokers. But just one disclaimer, this is a collection of smokers and non-smokers. If the number 31.5%, I am sure that if we had the data just for the smokers, the number will be higher than 31.5%. So that is a serious thing. Then if you see here in men, more vulnerable are smokers and in women more vulnerable are women with asthma and immune disorders and i think we know that medically women have more immune disorders compared to men even then women had a lesser prevalence of or a risk of becoming severe compared to men because of smoking so smoking is still a worst risk than asthma or immune disorders. Then another point here. So point number one was the, the incidence is increasing. Point number two was that the severity, the risk of severe cases in youngsters are also increasing. Now point number three, one in four will become long hauler. Children, youngsters, one in four will become long hauler. Would you or me or anyone like the child to suffer for a longer period of time? So one in four will become a long hauler. And the definition here, look at this, long hauler in this definition, it is not a long hauler that we have been discussing where it, it is months after. Their definition is they compared it to flu. <coughs> Excuse me. They compared the situation to flu. In case of flu, outpatient patients usually recover within two weeks. However, in this case, two weeks and onwards, they found that in COVID-19 cases, they were some of them were still suffering with the symptoms. And what is that percentage? Look at this, 18 to 34 years of age, one in four, 25% of youngsters in this age will become long hauler and they would have symptoms and suffering even after two, three weeks of the recovery. 35 to 49 years of age, one in three, 33% become long haulers. 
or have persistent symptoms after weeks. I consider long haulers that are continuing over months as well. So here in this definition, once again, in this study, this is weeks, two or three weeks and onwards. Greater than 50 years of age, one in two continue to have persistent symptoms. So 50%. So if you focus here for a second, this is another reason that children should not be exposed to the infection or extra risk. And one way to do that is to send them to schools and colleges and dorms and bars, which are the cause of the infection. So overall, the study found that about 35% of the population that develops outpatient symptoms, that means they do not become severe enough or critical enough to end up in a hospital and with on a bed and or on ventilator, so these are folks who are in outpatient. They come in, they, they do not have enough severe symptoms to be in the hospital. They take their medicines, they go back home. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me, smoke is too much. Uh, the outpatient, 35% have lingering symptoms. So once again, I, I want to keep it focused to children. So third point, they can become long haulers. So first point, I'll keep repeating it, first point, the infection or number of cases are rising in children. They then become super spreaders as well. Second point, the severity of the cases or the risk for becoming severe is 33%, one in three people, that's a lot. And then one in four will become long haulers as well. Then the fourth point is there are schools and colleges that are opening up and then they are closing down as well. So let's look at some of these as well. So, and I'm gonna keep this discussion today short so that I can request you and hope from you that you can share it. Those folks who have children and who are planning for them to go back to school or universities, please share it with them. At least they should be aware of what is going on. Decision is there, decision is communities, decision is universities, colleges, but the information should be available. So look at some schools and colleges. Washington State University, Pullman, 18 to 24 years of age, folks. Now check this out. In Pullman, city of Pullman, since the pandemic has started, since the pandemic has started, they had 150 total cases. But since the university opened, just on one day, Friday, they had 30 new cases. Can you imagine this? So since the pandemic, that town only had 150 cases. And when the university opened and people came back, just in one day, they had 30 new cases. And so uh, just in general, they are a town of 34,000 population. They have one hospital with 24 beds in that hospital. University of North Carolina opened last week with social distancing measures. So they have all the right measures that do the social distancing and everything. Even then, 177 students tested positive within one week and university closed on this Monday. University of Notre Dame, they have halted their in-person teaching for two weeks because as soon as they opened, they had 100 and 47 new cases since August 3rd. So August 3rd to now, <clears throat> 147 new cases. So they said, fine, let's go back to remote teaching. I cannot imagine why we continue to insist that children should come back to universities. I understand staying at home has a psychological uh, outcome, which is not positive. Depression is common as well. So for students and uh, um, youngsters going out in the universities, having that uh, social interaction is very important. But here we are talking about the lives of the people as well. So just a few more weeks, just a few more months, and we should do better. So Un University of Notre Dame halted their in-person classes. We should actually take this opportunity to mature the remote teaching systems and figure out how do we do some socialization, socialization as well. So this may actually push us to the next level of uh, next way of teaching. I used to think because I run an online medical education system, so I am always biased towards online teaching. I used to think that in another 10 years, there will be no universities or universities would only have 
uh, some in-person work and the remaining would all shift towards online. I think this is the time now to start becoming online. And this is happening a lot as well. Then uh, <clears throat> Michigan State University, 187 positive linked to an outbreak at a college bar. The problem with the opening up the schools and colleges, especially the colleges, is that number one, dorms are closed community. Number two, classrooms are condensed area. The R naught or the spread rate is higher in those because the contact is higher. And then the college bars are specifically places where this happens, the spread happens. So Michigan State University, they shifted to remote teaching as well after 187 people tested positive from a college bar spread or outbreak. Similarly, University of Kentucky, 189 positive since August 3rd. And there is the list continues. I wanted to make my points here. So this is it. This is the discussion for today. It is just a short discussion. My request to you is that please share it. And this is not a favor to Mubeen. I think that this is a favor to everyone who has children. Please realize this. Let me just once again back up and and make these points here. Number one, the cases are increasing in children, in youngsters. Number two, when the cases are increasing, the severity is also increasing. And they're saying that the dis difference between the older ages and younger ages that used to be there is now shrinking. That is a huge issue. And number three, children are becoming long haulers as well. We do not want that. And number four, it is proven now that as universities and schools are trying to open up, they are having issues with the test cases being positive. So there, there was I was reading about Mississippi as well. Mississippi opened up their schools and colleges. And I think with since they opened, 2,000 students tested positive and 600 teachers tested, tested positive. So they, they closed again. So one, I would also like to hear from you that whatever is your uh, area, tell me how is it in your area? Um, have, have you seen this kind of outbreak in your local schools or in your children's school? Uh, is your community deciding to open or not? When are they deciding to open? Have they opened? What is the result of that? Please tell me and tell me in the comments. But this is the discussion I wanted to do for today. I do not believe schools and colleges and universities should open at this time just because of the risk to children and the risk to the rest of the population around them. So with this, let's stop. Next week, we will talk about complement system. That is a part of immune system we have not talked about. We'll talk about bradykinin system or the bradykinin storm. And we'll talk about a few new drugs. And I'm trying to have some uh, Dr. Brody from Australia who's been using ivermectin. I'm trying to see if he can join us and another doctor from here. Interestingly, Dr. Saluth, Dr. Uh, John Campbell, and Dr. Zelenko have not decided to join us. But that's fine. That is their choice. So thank you very much. Um, talk to you tomorrow, or actually Monday. Uh, have a nice weekend and uh, stay safe and healthy.